few of you can imagine ever seeing or feeling a tumor of this size growing on a woman's body. Can you imagine it's there? It's painful. It's obvious. You can see it through the clothing. It often smells. It's difficult to treat. The outcome is poor. And there's very little that we can do. Now, in the first six months I was in Singapore, coming from Stockholm, Sweden, from Karolinska, I saw more of these tumors on women that I had seen in 10 years in Stockholm. Now, but what if, what if the mass is this big? Still very big, still can be seen, can be removed with difficulty, but the outcome is not very good. So what if the tumor was this big, the size of a tennis ball? You can definitely remove this. You can do so. About half of the women survive if we do so. So it's still too big. So what if the tumor was the size of this ping pong ball? Now this we can remove. It can still be felt in most women. If I remove it, the outcome is quite good, but it's still too big. So what we're looking for is actually tumors the size of this, of these M and M. See them? They're very tiny. If we can find tumors this size, the outcome is fantastic. Won't deform the breast, the chance of cure is high, but you can't feel this because it's too small. So I'm going to talk to you about seeing what you cannot feel mm -hmm. and how that matters for breast cancer. But all stories, they need a start. So my story starts with my old teacher. This is Hans Rusling. He's the lovely mad professor from Karolinska. He's a fantastic individual, professor in global health, spent 20 years of his life studying poverty in Africa. So he was my teacher and he has inspired me. But what he did and what he does, he says, don't assess the world as you think it is. Assess the world as it actually is. So don't base it on your previous biases. Just take a look. And it matters for breast cancer. Why does it matter? It matters because the world has changed. And that when the world changes, the risk of breast cancer changes dramatically. So. What he did is that he gave us an opportunity to look at the world. So let's look at the world and see how it impacts breast cancer. So the first thing that happened in the world is that we're making more money, particularly in Asia. Every bubble is a country. The size of the bubble is the population. So, and the red ones are Asia. So if you look at Asia, low and middle income countries, 1960s, 1970s. Japan is up on top, doing very well. Singapore is coming there, going past them. And now we're at present day, and let's forecast a little bit. And we're now we're moving forward, and Asia has become, to Trump's disappointment, a very, very powerful continent. No longer low income, middle and high income. But what happens to individuals when they make money? What happens? Well, family size changes. Family size goes from a big family to a small family. And this is one of the biggest drivers for breast cancer. Having no children, having them late, is probably the best awful fuel there is for breast cancer. So let's see what happens to family size. We'll do the same exercise. Each country is a bubble. The size of the bubble is the population. You'll see India and China. For some reason, it's political change. China says one child per woman. You have Singapore dropping because there was a you know, two is enough policy. What it happens is that, you see how it conforms. All of Asia has now small family size. Now what happens to breast cancer? Keep in mind, making money, small family size. What happens to breast cancer risk? This happens. So this is an incident rate, the occurrence of breast cancer in Asia, from 1970 to present day. It's a five-fold increased risk of breast cancer. 
it's the same in Japan, it's the same in Korea, same in China, same all throughout Asia. So does this matter? Well, it does. Because now your mother's risk of breast cancer is twice that of your grandmother's. Your risk of breast cancer is twice that of your mother's. And the women in this room who don't have children, when you have a child, a female child, you double the risk again. Now keep in mind the denominator. We're in Asia. You have two billion women in Asia. That's not thousands, that's not millions. It's 2,000 million women who have a doubling in risk. This is an unfathomable amount of breast cancer being generated in Asia. So now I'm going to show you some not so nice pictures. If you don't like, if they make you uncomfortable, look away and I'll tell you when you can look again. So what we mean by advanced breast cancer is the following. So this is a lady that came to see us. Her tumor size is the size of a basketball. Can technically remove it, did so. But unfortunately, she passed away a few months later. Next lady, she's a lady of 50 years of age. The tumor is stuck to the underlying chest wall. Have to remove the ribs, reconstruct the chest. Again, it metastasized and she passed on. Third lady, now if you look at the picture, you see that there are skin changes all the way up until the shoulder, down into the abdominal area. This is technically not removable. So here we couldn't even remove the cancer and she later on passed away after chemotherapy. So now you can look again. So this sparked the idea. This doesn't need better surgery. It does not need better chemotherapy. It does not need better radiotherapy. It needs a change in mindset. This is not a hospital problem, it's a societal problem. So I joined my friend, a cousin from a different mother, mm -hmm. Philip. So Philip and I decided we need to do something. We need to understand the language that we're currently missing. We need to understand why women do this. Why do they put themselves in harm's way? So we've married two passions. We like motorcycles. So we went on a journey from Singapore to Sweden. Because I'm Swedish and he's Singaporean. But then what we did was we wanted to educate. We wanted to create awareness. We wanted to raise funds. And we wanted to raise research collaborations. Because by doing so, we would have the narrative of women through Asia. So we took a journey through Asia, a lot of vast nothing. Asia is a huge country. But we did so to hear stories. So traveling through Asia, we interviewed women. We listened to their stories. We had them tell us, you know, what has happened. But let me share one story. This is a story of Madame Li. She's from Yunnan, one of the more rural areas in China. She's a farmer. She noticed that something was wrong with her breast, but she couldn't leave the farm because there was no one to tend to the farm. The second problem she had is that there was no transportation to get her to the hospital. So when we saw her, she had finally made it to the hospital after having suffered a fair bit of pain, and finally she went there. She had been undergoing chemotherapy, it was again too late, she was metastatic, but she's a very brave lady, so she shared her story with us, and it became a part of a book. But what she wanted to convey is that it doesn't have to be like this. She wanted to share her story so that women could change their behavior to come to the hospital earlier. So now I'm going to give you a quiz. I'm going to ask you which of these two breasts has something wrong with them. Now, to your left, you would say, well, it's obviously the one to the left. There are skin changes, there's inflammation in the skin. I see a tumor pressing underneath the skin, it deforms it. So that's obviously the one with breast cancer, it doesn't need a doctor. But what about the one here to the right? It looks healthy, but it isn't. Inside this breast is the smallest seed of cancer, that little M&M, that if left alone, it will grow and develop into a tumor, just like the one to the left. But the only way that we can find this is to see what you cannot feel. <coughs> so now let me tell you the complete story about size. Remember, I mentioned that tennis balls too big. I think all of us can agree. We would also agree that, well, is this too big? Well, actually it is. Because what we're really looking for is the following. We're not looking for M&Ms. 
we're looking for salt, just like this. Cancer the size of this. And if we find cancer the size of salt, just like this, it's completely curable. There is minimal damage to the breast. We just need to see it, identify it, remove it, and if we do so, we'll be able to cure. But the only way to do that is to take pictures. You as a woman would never know. So again, let me share a story, a local story. So this is a heartbreaking story, but it's hauntingly familiar to many of us that are in the hospital. So a lady came to see me. She was worried about her mom. She, had, she figured her mom had fallen ill. They were planning for the wedding of the brother. But the mom didn't want to come to the hospital, so I said, okay, never mind, I'll come and see you. So I went to their house, I had a cup of coffee with the daughter, and reluctantly the mom came. She was this gentle, lovely teacher who came to see us after a while. She had noticed that something was wrong with the breast. It started to get red, a bit inflamed. She took an ointment because she thought it was an infection. But she didn't want to bother the family because there was an upcoming wedding. She had saved for it. She had spent a lot of money. She was looking forward to it. Now, I had to have the not-so-nice pleasure of telling her that, I'm sorry, it's breast cancer, and it has already spread. It has metastasized. She still didn't want any treatment. So I said, OK, it's a personal choice. But she said, I still want the wedding to happen. So they decided to push on and have the wedding. Unfortunately, she died one week before the wedding. Now, this is a story with a sad ending. But it's an obvious story that didn't have to add, end this way. It could have had a much happier ending. Because all it needed was a little bit of awareness, a little bit of courage, a little bit of a nudge from family and friends to allow us to find that initial tumor at a size when it was completely treatable. So now let me see if I can give you an impact. What does it matter? Does it matter that we find things early or late? So let's go back to Asia. Let's think about tumor size. So I've zeroed the clock here at the year 2000. On the y-axis, we have number of women who have died in Asia of breast cancer since 2000. It looks like this. To present day, about 4 million women have died of breast cancer in Asia. That's a lot of women. We're now at an inflection point. We're at a point where if we don't do anything, it'll look like this. We'll see about 10 million women dead by 2030. That's the country of Sweden. That's my entire old country wiped out. If we feel, fail the public health initiative and we let tumors to grow bigger, it's off the scale. It's Sweden, Norway, and Finland gone. But what if? we do something else. What if we actually change our behavior so that we find tumors between the size of this tennis ball and this ping pong ball? Now that's the green curve. The green curve is actually finding tumors that are smaller. You realize more cancers doubling, still no real increase in mortality. But if we go to the size of this M&M and this ping pong ball, then it will look like the green curve, or even the blue curve. So just finding all tumors in Asia at this rate. You realize now the difference in mortality between doing nothing, just continuing at present rate, versus finding it at a smaller rate. The impact is enormous, and we're then able to actually change an epidemic. So I'm not sure if any one of you know anyone who has passed on from breast cancer. But very soon you will, because it's a silent epidemic. There are women all throughout Asia that are disappearing. Their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunts, their sisters, their daughters, and they're dying. And very soon all of us in Asia will know someone who's died from breast cancer because it's an epidemic of a proportion that has never been seen in the world before. So you have an option. You can go and see a doctor when you're sick, meaning that you actually 
wait until you have a symptom. That's not going to work. If we're going to change this epidemic, it's not for doctors to change. It's for all of us to change. We need to change our behavior. We need to nudge each other and nudge all of our female friends to actually go and be examined. To move away from a paradigm, I feel sick, I go and see a doctor, to the fact that I want to prevent this. I want to actually find it early. I want to allow the doctors to see this when I cannot feel it. And if we do so, the amount of good we can do at no cost, no improved surgery, no improved chemotherapy, just a change in mindset is the biggest scale of saved lives that you can imagine. Thank you for listening.